Hello, I'm Fiona Sitkin, a host of the talk show, The Bridge for Women Worldwide. We launched a new series on The Bridge, new series of interviews called Jewish Mothers Worldwide Speak About Israel. Here, mothers from different countries speak their native languages, English or Russian or Ukrainian, and they talk about their thoughts and feelings, sharing what they really think about the hot, hot situation in Israel. We love and respect our mothers, so let us show some respect listening to them because mother knows best, right? Right. The topic today is a mama from Montclair, New Jersey, speaks about Israel with a guest, Siona Benjamin, originally from India. Hello, Siona. Hi. Um, you will hear from a remarkable artist who learned by experience what it takes for a woman to hold her own raising remarkable kids. Siona went a long way establishing herself as an outstanding artist, Indian, American, and Jewish. Her art represents her transcultural and multicultural narrative. We can see Siona's art in many galleries and museums. She also is doing installations private in public places. Again, welcome to our talk show, Siona. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, could you please tell us how you are related to Israel? Do you still have any relatives there? And what shaped your attitude? Please share where you are coming from to this conversation, providing a bit of your background, if you please. So as you said, um, I'm, I'm a Jew from India. Uh, my family is mostly from that part of the world. Um, as you know, as most people should know that Jews came from India, Iran, Iraq, um, you know, Afghanistan, all those, the, the whole Fertile Crescent area. Uh, there are many Jews of color, including Jews from Morocco and in Ethiopia and all those countries too in Israel. So it's a very multicultural country. It's not just uh, Jews from Eastern Europe. So I'm one of those, uh, you know, Jews of color, so to speak. Um, I have very strong ties with Israel because um, a lot of my family from that part of the world in Asia, they moved to Israel um, over several years, many years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So I have a lot of cousins. My father's mother moved with my uncle to Israel and died in Beersheba. Uh, my mother's mother actually moved with my uncle Mordecai uh, to Cleveland, Ohio. And so, and both my grandfathers died in India. So uh, my parents continued to live in India, but my mother would visit me very often because I came here to study, to go to graduate school in art. But all of that family that moved to Israel is still there. And I am close to a lot of them, most of them, all of them. Um, a lot of cousins, a lot of cousins' kids. Um, I, you know, receive a lot of news from them. I was in Israel the last last year when my daughter, uh, Rachel, um, who has who, who was in marketing before, but then she recently in the last two, three years, three years ago, she became a chef. So she went to intern in Israel through a program called Masa. She was there for six months. I went to visit her. Before that, I, I was visiting family again. Before that, I had a Fulbright in Israel for six months. Um, so, you know, I and before that, I've visited, I don't know how many number of times. <laughs> it's like from the time I was a kid. So okay. I'm very close ties with Israel, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's nice to hear. Thank you so much for sharing. Um. I know, Siona, that you are happy with your life and proud of your children. Every mama does, right? Now, could 
could you please share what were you feeling on that terrible morning of October 7, when you heard about this sudden terrorist attack on the peaceful citizens of Israel, about bloody atrocities, about hostage taking. How do you remember that day unfolding? It was beyond shocking, but <clears throat> I mean, I was shocked because I felt like Israel has a very good defense system. So I was very shocked to hear that so much vulnerability was possible towards like, civilians and that so many people got killed and so many people got injured. But once that shock had settled, I was, you know, it was like um, for many days, actually weeks, and I got many phone calls, messages from friends and family. I have also, I also have a lot of friends in Israel because since I've shown there, I'm in a collection of a museum there, I've shown in, during my Fulbright, I showed at various galleries. So I have like not only family, but I also have friends. So. I, I still actually till it just goes on. Like I get through WhatsApp, I get a lot of messages, videos of shared of, you know, what's really happening there. And even though some, you know, it's kind of very overwhelming, but that day, especially, I just was glued in front of the TV. I couldn't believe what was happening. I just could not understand. Like, how is this? What happened to the Iron Dome? What happened to security? Like, this was a very, you know, they were right near the, the border and so why wasn't there anybody there um so it was very it's been very very troubling and devastating for me okay thank you so did anybody of your friends and family actually suffer um well thank god but there's no actual close family but i have uh, you know um a, a cousin's um daughter from her husband's side um, I mean, when the war immediately started, her aunt died in the war um, from her husband's side. Um, I have uh, several cousins who actually knew a couple of people in the music festival who were killed. Um, and so, I mean, and I have several cousins, kids who have now been recruited are in the army. Um, I also have some friends. Uh, I have an artist friend in Jerusalem who's two sons and um, one son-in-law is in the army fighting up front, like in Gaza. And uh, my friend Andy's um, son-in-law just lost an eye. Uh, so he had to come back. Yeah, he lost an eye. So they're going to give him an artificial eye. But at least, you know, the whole, the whole philosophy is like, oh, at least I'm alive. Uh -huh. Some people are losing legs and limbs and stuff like that. And uh, they're saying, oh, at least I'm alive. That's mm -hmm. the kind of desperate situation there. So this person, you know, this, my friend's um, son-in-law is a father of young kids and he lost an eye. So I'm hearing this kind of news. Um, most of my, some of my family are, they were kind of living near, kind of close to the area of Gaza, but they've moved up north um, to another kibbutz. So they're not, they're, they're not one of the settlers, but they, their kibbutz was nearer that area. So I've heard that they moved there from their father, who's uh, my first cousin, um, you know, things like that. I'm constantly hearing things. Mm -hmm. People are also, friends and family are sending me lots of videos of what's happening. And it's very interesting, but sometimes it gets overwhelming. And my daughter has been telling me, you know, I mean, I've been doing my work because fortunately I'm really busy, but like, you know, sometimes I feel like I need to shut it off, but I just can't because I feel like if I don't answer somebody, it's like rude. I, I have to answer everybody who messages me. So it's an endless, you know, it's like between WhatsApp and instant messaging and phone calls. And it's just been very overwhelming. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing it so emotionally. I do understand it. Well, Siona, today, when the tragic events and the war in Gaza rage on and will probably last for a long time, we need to think of peace. We need to plan for peace, right? Yes. And here is my main question. Imagine you could have a direct access to those in power, either in Israel or in the United States or elsewhere. 
what three pieces of advice would you give to them? Advice or recommendation or method, how to normalize and stabilize the situation, how to establish peace and how to achieve peace for all children on earth, please. This, oh my God, that is a very big question. It is. <laughs> Yeah, it's a huge question. I mean, I could talk for a long time about that, but um, I just want to start off by saying, I think I'll start off over here. I was raised a Jew in India with Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Buddhists. Uh, some of my best friends in India were Muslims and still are. Um, I'm still in touch with my high school friends who are a group on through WhatsApp and they just wished me for my birthday this week. And, and you know, like, so, and two of my best friends growing up in school, one was Muslim girl, me, the Jewish girl, and there was another Portuguese Christian. So Muslim, Jewish, and Christian, we were three best friends and we went to each other's houses. So I wanna make that really clear in the beginning that I have nothing against Muslims. I have very close friends. My family would send sweets during the Rosh Hashanah to my, not only to our Jewish friends and family, but also to all the other friends. Um, I, I go to Israel, I see, I buy my hamsas from Palestinian shops, you know, in Jerusalem, um, you know, my, my jewelry, and I, I don't differentiate. And I've also seen that my family doesn't differentiate. When they go shopping to the, to the shuk, they buy vegetables from an Arab vendor, you know. Um, that's the way I think it should be, but unfortunately, it is not. And I think it is because, not because of the Palestinian people, not because of the Israeli people. It is because of Hamas. Hamas has to be eliminated. No matter what you say or how you look at it, Hamas is a terrorist organization. They do not want peace. They don't want peace for, forget about Israel or any other part of the world. They don't want peace for their own people. They're using their own people as human shields. They're hiding weapons under schools and hospitals. Whoever is not seeing that needs to just come to terms with that. You know, it is, again, I always say this. I am free Palestine, yes, but free Palestine from Hamas. That should be the slogan, not just free Palestine from the Jews, because it's, I mean, yes, every country has done some mistakes. United States, for example, should be giving the land back to the Native Americans. Why? Because we colonized here and we took the land away from the native people. So then we should get out of here too, all of us. So there is no land that belongs to any one person. Jews and Arabs have lived in the Middle East for centuries. There has been proof historically that Jews have lived there during the Roman times and even before. So there is no such thing as my land, your land, or my food, your food, or my customs, your customs. It is Middle Eastern and it is shared. Recently, somebody told, asked me at a party, we're talking about food and I talked about my, my daughter working for an Israeli restaurant. And this person said, well, there's no such thing as Israeli food. I didn't say anything to her. I just asked her this one question. I said, you like Indian food? And she said, yeah, I do. I said, do you like this dish called biryani? It's like this layered rice and meat and vegetable dish. Oh, I love it, she said. I said, it's not Indian. It, it, it is now considered Indian, but the dish comes from Pakistan and Iran. That's a kind of a layered rice dish that originates from the Mughal Empire, which came into India centuries ago. But now it has become an Indian dish. So don't claim anything as your own because it all belongs to all of us. And we improvise and we share and we move around and Indian Jewish food is more Indian, but it has a lot of Jewishness in it. Is it just going to be called Indian food or is it just Jewish food? No, it is Indian and Jewish food. Moroccan food and Yemenite food is Moroccan and, Ye and Jewish food. Yemenite food is Jewish and Yemenite food. So this business of like claiming it to be your own, I think people should just give it up because there's no such thing of just belonging to a certain land. Palestine, Palestinian, there was no Palestine before the formation of Israel. If you, if people can just read the history of that area, 
There was no Palestine. People lived there. I know, I know, I have friends and family. I have friends especially who have, who have lived there before this formation of the state of Israel. So, you know, who got kicked out? Yeah, and a few bargain, a few people did get kicked out, which is wrong and they should be compensated. But this whole thing about like from river to the sea, Palestine will be free, that, that's nonsense. Because, the, and that's not gonna happen. So, you know, I think people should just learn about the history. There are a lot of people also who never been to Israel, don't know about Jewishness, about the history of Israel or about the history of the Holocaust or anything, but they have a lot of opinions because they've read articles or they've read stuff from the internet. Well, <laughs> they need to educate themselves before they talk about a certain topic. And I'm even not saying that I'm totally educated about it, but I do know because I've been there. I have seen Jews and, Mus Jews and Palestinians walking together in the same streets. It's possible. And Palestinians get jobs in Israel. They get paid more in Israel than they do in Gaza. And also, one thing that people need to understand, all the aid that has been going to the Palestinian people sent by the UN has been stolen by the Hamas people. They use it to build their ammunitions. They, they, stay, they steal food from the, old, from the aid that comes to their own Palestinian people. So people need to understand it's not about Palestine or the Palestinian people. It's about getting rid of a terrorist organization called Hamas. Loud and clear, that's all I have to say. <laughs> that's, you know, I have nothing against, I think Palestinian people should live amicably with Israeli people. I think we are a, a, a similar kind of, we are like step brothers and sisters. We are, we are like siblings. Yeah. Okay? The Arab people and the, is, and the Jewish people. What is the meaning of a Sabra? A Sabra is a person, is a Jewish person from the, mid, from the Middle East. That is somebody who's there. Similarly, uh, Arab is also a Sabra in that way. But there are terrorist organizations out there whose ulterior motive is just to, to get themselves rich and to use other people as scapegoats. And that is what ISIS and Hamas is. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of information. I am very, very grateful to you. Thank you ever so much, Siona. I am with you on that. These ideas are great. Um, finally, my friends, let me thank you for watching The Bridge for Women Worldwide. And please subscribe to our channel. It is now over 10,000 subscribers strong and counting. And let us connect right here on the YouTube via the comments to our videos and also via my book site, www.fionasetkin.com. Many thanks. And now our guest, Siona Benjamin and myself, we both wish you to stay well and healthy. We will win. We shall overcome this war and be young. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Salute.